Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. She ran after the car, hoping to catch up with it, to rest her son Michael from the hands of this terrible man. The weather was disgusting, it had rained since morning, forming huge bubbles on the pavement, and the piercing wind drove them across the smooth surface of the puddles. She was completely soaked. She thought she might just get a hold of the door handle, but the wet asphalt left her no chance. She fell down, smashed her knees and palms bloody, but she still couldn't get her son. Water was streaming down her face, and it was impossible to tell if it was tears or rain. She knew there was no use in going to the police, he already had an agreement about everything, so she made her way to the house, shaking her legs with difficulty. She had to take her time to think about what to do next. When she returned, she treated her shattered knees, and sat down to drink hot tea. She held the cup in her palms, her mother loved to drink tea so much, and the memories flowed by themselves, like a little stream flowing, hoping to meet another stream, to become stronger together, to reach the river and happily dissolve in its strong waters. When she arrived in the capital, she was that little brook looking for support so that she would not be lost in the turbulent vortex of the capital's turbulent life. She came to the capital from a small town, after graduating from high school. She wasn't an AAS student, but she didn't have SCs on her diploma either. As she stepped off the train, she was distracted, admiring the scale of the capital. Then, as she gathered her thoughts, she realized that the suitcase was gone. She screamed very loudly. Many gawkers had gathered around her, even a policeman came up, but they could do little to help. The thief was nowhere to be found. Her suitcase mostly contained clothes, warm clothes, and now she was left in a light dress and a blouse. True, she had the money with her, sewn into her underwear, no one would get there. And her documents were in her purse, which hung like a mailbag over her shoulder. Everyone began to disperse, there was nothing more to see or hear, such things happened at a Moscow station every day. She did not get into the institute, but she did not want to go home. For a year, she had to struggle from one job to another. She worked as a janitor, washed porches, even managed to work for four months in one diner, which was loudly called a café. Laughing. There sat such low people, they swore so profanely that even a slightly decent person would not even pick up the door handle of such an institution, not to mention spending time there. And she worked, out of desperation. She worked there and got a bite to eat, and they paid her money, even if it wasn't much. Sometimes drunken men would slip small bills into her pocket. But if the owner saw it, he'd take half of it away, the bastard. She would give it back. She just had no other choice, the boss would let her live in the back room. For that, she'd wash the floors for free before she started work. It was a hard time, but she survived, she didn't drink, she didn't start smoking or taking drugs. And everything would have been fine, but there was a guy, who looked like he had just got out of prison, as the convicts say. She was afraid of him. He had such a heavy, jaundiced look in his eyes. He kept spreading his hands and wanted to get under her skirt. He did it roughly and painfully, leaving bruises on her body. When she pushed him away, he would grab her hand and squeeze it so hard that her wrist would have blue bracelets on it. She complained to the owner and he would talk to him, but he promised to ruin the owner's life too. Alan, the owner of the cafe, said she had better quit. Otherwise, neither she nor he would get any peace. She went nowhere. Now she even shuddered at the memory and wondered how she could stand it all and cope. She bought a newspaper and started looking at ads for where to get another job. Not far from the kiosk, she saw a playground where mothers were walking with their babies. She sat down on a vacant bench and began to study who was needed where. She was so caught up in her job search that she didn't notice how some toddler tried to sit down next to her on the bench. Sighing heavily after his righteous labors, he said loudly, Hello. Oh, hello. How handsome you are. How old is a boy like you? Four, and he showed four fingers, what's your name, the little boy asked. Sarah, and you? Mama calls me Michael. Michael. 
What a beautiful name. And where is your mother? Little and so pretty boys can't go out alone. There's my mother. When Sarah looked where he was pointing his finger, she saw a young woman running toward them, blonde, dressed in expensive clothes, quite interesting. Are you making acquaintances again? She asked her son jokingly. Her name is Sarah, she's beautiful. That's what a future man means. You need to learn how to say a P, and you won't be worth the price of a suitor. She turned her attention to the newspaper, which Sarah was about to put away in her bag, looking for a job. Yes, only so far without success. Are you a commuter, or a local? I came here, I didn't pass my college exams, and I don't want to go back home. Things are hopeless there. I'll have to do my own climbing. You've got a lovely baby boy. All right, I'll be off. Goodbye. Where are you going? The baby asked. I don't know yet, but I'll certainly think of something. Wouldn't you agree to sit with your son for two or three hours at a time while I go shopping and make lunch? It may not be prudent of me to entrust my child to a girl I don't know, but I feel you're a good person. And Michael feels people. He would never go near a bad person. I'm more than happy to do it. Especially since employers don't line up for me. Are you married? I'm divorced, but my ex-husband pays me good alimony, and I can afford a babysitter for two to three hours. We just have to agree on a price. And she named such an amount that Sarah almost fell over. At Allen's she would have worked for six months to get that kind of money. I can't pay you more than that amount, if you agree, let's go. I certainly agree, said Sarah cheerfully, how should I address you? My name is Lawrence, but you can just call me Larry. That's my mother's name too, said Sarah. She thought it was a sign, a sign that things were getting better and would only get better from now on. When they got to the apartment, Larry asked to see her ID. After looking at Sarah's passport, she first wanted to take it so she could keep it, but Sarah wouldn't give it back, saying you could take a picture of it with your phone and you couldn't take it away. Larry agreed and took the picture. The apartment was large and she was shown her room. It was similar in size to a bathroom. There was a bed, a chair, and a small nightstand. There was no window, apparently it had once been a storage room. But Alan's back room was worse. There at night she could hear rustling rats. The first night she slept like a log, but she left the door open because it was so stuffy in that so-called bedroom. Larry was not at all talkative, she only gave orders, which Sarah carried out with the speed of an electric broom. Of course, not only did she babysit in Larry's absence, she also cleaned the apartment, did the laundry, and ironed the children's clothes. Sarah herself thought that for such a salary, she could do it. It had been a month since Sarah had worked for Larry. Today she should get her first money. She had been looking forward to it and had already planned what she would buy with it. But that day Larry didn't call her to pay for her work. The next day it was the same. Sarah was beginning to worry that she had just been scammed. But three days later, Sarah called her in, apologized for the late paycheck, and gave her the amount she had been promised. She said she was happy with her work and would leave her to continue working for the time being. Sarah worked for her for six months. She dressed up, bought everything for winter, boots, a sheepskin coat, a warm hat. She had never had such beautiful things. At last she would not be cold, but would go out with Michael for as long as he wanted. She hadn't become friends with Larry, and Sarah hadn't been friends with her. It would only cost herself, all this friendship with the rich. She did her job honestly and loved the child very much, Larry saw that and was calm about her son. In the evening Sarah was preparing for college. Her longtime dream was to become a professional photographer. Back in 8th grade, she found her father's old camera and, oddly enough, it worked. She began to take pictures for fun. And already in the 10th class she had a personal exhibition at school. The exhibition was called, The Life of Our Class. It was really life. The exhibition was wonderful, the whole neighborhood visited it. She received a diploma and, of course, a good camera for that time. In 11th grade, there was a second exhibition, Take Care of Nature. 
it's alive. There were colorful and so touching pictures, squirrels eating from hands, a hare with huge ears, standing on its hind legs. She spent hours standing or lying in the woods to capture an interesting moment. That's where her preparation for her big profession began. It's good that she had the bag with the pictures in it and didn't lose it at the train station. Otherwise, it was the work of four years. She showed these pictures to Larry, who marveled at how great they were and said she should definitely go to school. Sarah secretly wanted to make a scrapbook of Michael. She had already taken the pictures on two tapes, and when Larry wasn't home, she chose the best ones and had them printed. On the day the baby was born, Sarah had a gift ready, a beautiful album of baby photos. She framed what she thought was the most beautiful. Larry, seeing such a gift, wept, it was so touching. The baby didn't even know he was being photographed and so the pictures came out alive. From that moment on Larry helped Sarah to work at weddings, exhibitions, and other events. She wasn't getting many of those because that niche was crowded with professionals, but she was also lucky enough to make some money. With that money she bought good equipment, film, and perfected her skills every free minute. Six months later Sarah offered her a job at her acquaintance's cottage. The house is small, you will be paid two or even three times more than me. Take it. I don't feel like leaving you and Michael. You've become like family to me. Well, you have to earn money, pay your tuition, and you won't make much with me. Larry was right about that. She wasn't going to get in on a budget, and the tuition wasn't small. Grudgingly, Sarah agreed. The house really was small, two stories. Her duties included general cleaning once a week and just cleaning three times a week. She didn't know the difference between a simple cleaning and a general cleaning, but she was too embarrassed to ask, and decided she would figure it out as she went along. There were three people living in the house. The husband, his mother, and his wife. Her relationship with her husband's mother didn't work out right away. She followed Sarah on her heels, watching what she was doing, how she was doing it, stepping over the mop, walking on the wet floor and saying, you clean badly, very badly. I'll tell you not to get your whole paycheck. You don't deserve it. Sarah cried, started what she thought was a more thorough cleaning, but it didn't help. Catherine would still find flaws and poke her in the nose. After getting her first paycheck, she decided to talk to Amelia, the landlady, I want to leave you. I won't be able to clean your house, because I won't please your mother-in-law anyway. She follows me around and pokes her nose where she thinks it's badly cleaned. Well, Sarah, you're not. I'm happy with your work and don't mind her. You know that's easier said than done. I can't be rude to an older man, I keep everything to myself and it makes me more tired than physical work. Let me go, please. Let's have it this way, you work until I find a replacement for you. And I'll talk to my mother-in-law. That evening, Sarah heard Amelia arguing with her mother-in-law. If you keep sticking your nose where it doesn't belong, you'll go to your house. I'm not going to put up with you anymore. A third cleaning lady comes in, and you drive her out. Why don't you mop the floors yourself? What? Me scrub the floors? How dare you talk to me like that you are without lineage, without tribe. Do you remember when my son pulled you out of that dumpster? Brought you home, clothed you, gave you an education. What were you, remember? I remember everything. I wasn't made of stone either. When your son started courting me, I already had a higher education, and I was, for a minute, the director of the financial department. And I was going to marry, by the way, the general director of this company. So don't tell me what a benefactor your son is. I did it all myself. I'm warning you again not to get in the way of Sarah doing her job. Don't you yell at me. You can't even have a baby with him. It's been a year you've been living and you're still empty. Are you a woman? I don't understand what he sees in you and still blows the dust off you? When he gets here, I'll talk to him and he'll send you back to your crazy mother and I'll stay here, understand? Got it. So, are we going to fight? Who's stronger? Well, let's give it a try. After all, he can't be with his mother all his life. He needs a family. 
You're like that famous movie, Sonny, why do you need a wife when you have a mother? But you and I have different missions. If you love your son, don't piss me off. Otherwise, it will be bad for everyone. You, too, first of all. Her mother-in-law was afraid of her because she knew how much her son loved her. Why? Why doesn't she love me like that? I'm a mother. He had a lot to dislike her for. As an 11th grader, her son, Colas, as his mother called him in French, fell in love with a girl from the parallel class. Betty was a wonderful girl. Clever, beautiful, modest, and a great student. But Her Majesty Love messed up all plans. Betty became pregnant, the father was to be Colas. The guys agreed to get married after their final exams. They decided to arrange a wedding when they could earn their own money. Betty's parents were simple factory workers. But they were kind, honest people, and they raised their daughter that way. As soon as Catherine found out she was pregnant, she met her after school, grabbed her by the elbow, and dragged her away so Colas wouldn't see them. Listen, honey. If you're hoping to marry Colas and hang your baby on him, you know you can't do it. I know you have fostered this child, and since my son is a decent man, you want to take advantage of it. There you go. And the grown woman shoved a big fistful under the baby's nose. If you don't have an abortion, I'm going to smear you to the whole school. I'll write to the party organization of the factory, let your parents get nailed for the terrible upbringing of their daughter. I'll give you a good life, you bitch. That was the end of the story. The next day the whole school knew that Betty had hanged herself. There was no note, no explanation. There was a baby and no baby. Colas took the death of the girl he loved very hard, he even went to the hospital. And only later he realized that his mother was to blame. She had made some sloppy remarks about Vera, and he understood. He smashed everything in the house, and everyone got hurt. But it was done, and Catherine never regretted it. And the son had since withdrawn and had no warm relations with his mother. He never invited her into his house, but he couldn't kick her out when she came. He had changed a lot since then. He became tougher and more ruthless. It was these qualities that allowed him to organize and promote a very serious banking business. But with his wife he tried to be loving and gentle. Sarah was finishing her second month, and there was still no replacement. It seemed to her that Amelia was not looking for her. But to be fair, it had to be said that Catherine was no longer clinging to her. She was walking around the garden, lying in the hammock, but she wouldn't go near her. One day, when Sarah had already finished cleaning and was in her room, they heard Catherine screaming. Turns out Colas had arrived, but to her he was Nicholas. She didn't like him right away. A sullen face, a crooked smile, and a look of some suspicion, like, I already know everything, and you have to confess. She didn't want to work for them, and when Amelia was paying her for the second month, she reminded her of her desire to leave. Well, it's not like Catherine is hitting on you now. Is that true? I'm keeping an eye on it. Your pay is good. What are you unhappy about right now? Sarah, come on, don't show off. I'm used to you and I want you to stay. She called Larry to see if she had taken someone in her place. Larry was glad to hear from her, but replied that her place was taken. Sarah was a little upset. She would have loved to go back to them, even at a lower salary. In the fall, Sarah enrolled in the Institute for Fine and Applied Arts. She was highly recommended this department, it added skills to aspiring photographers. And also on weekends she attended photography school, where she was taught by real and recognized masters of photographic art. The teachers noted in her personal qualities that photographers need a rich imagination, aesthetic taste, imagination, a sense of composition and, most importantly, patience. The question arose as to how she would have time to clean the house. Amelia suggested she clean twice after class and on Sunday to do a general cleaning. Sarah knew she wouldn't pick it all up, but Amelia made a killer argument. You have to pay tuition? You have to. Where are you going to get the money from? I don't. Then you stay. Amelia, you hit where it hurts. 
Now I suggest you make a deal. Let's try it for a month, if I'm down and I don't have time to clean, I'll take an easier job, okay? Deal. A month went by, Sarah was working her ass off. When she got up in the morning, she couldn't immediately figure out what day it was and where she had to run. Somehow, coming home from class, a good idea popped into her head. At the institute she had a girlfriend. The girl was very talented, though from the countryside. A little masculine, but healthy, just blood and milk. Shouldn't I get her to help clean the house? She will do the lighter work, which also takes a lot of time, and I will take the harder work. I'll give her part of my salary. We'll just have to ask Amelia's permission, Sarah thought as she fell asleep so she could wake up tomorrow and go back to work. The hostess gave her permission to bring Ginger, as she was called in the faculty, to see what would come out of Sarah's idea. Ginger immediately agreed and was happy to help Sarah and earn money, of course. Amelia enjoyed the cleanup. She went through the house, checking in the most unexpected places, but it was all clean. Ginger was taken in to help Sarah. She was much relieved. She had more time that she could use for studying, for getting out into nature, and, of course, for the beauty salon to get herself cleaned up. She got a short haircut, which suited her very well, got her hands cleaned up, and from then on she did everything with gloves on. She worked in that house for almost a year. The main irritant to the piece, Catherine, went home. The house immediately became quieter and calmer. On that unfortunate day Sarah returned from the institute alone, her partner was ill, and she had to do all the cleaning herself. Amelia had gone away on a business trip, and Sarah decided not to finish the job. She did not clean the rooms where they did not live. So she finished the cleaning quickly. The bathroom and toilet, too, were in perfect condition, she did not even look there. She lay in her room and read a book. When there was a knock at the door, she sat up abruptly on the bed and said, Come in. Nicholas came into the room and sat down on her bed. It was the first time ever, so Sarah was frightened. What, are you afraid of me? She thought his tone was kind of insolent. No, of course not, Sarah replied quietly and moved to a chair just in case. I've been looking at you for a year now, I like you. Especially, the figure. You're very seductive. Nicholas, I have to get up early tomorrow for the institute, let's say good night to each other and go our separate ways. I beg you very much. Well, all right, good night, said the host, got up and left the room. It seemed to Sarah that he had agreed to leave too quickly. She closed the door and lay down. But she couldn't sleep. She was pounding all over. She was scared out of her mind. An hour passed, maybe more. The house was quiet and she fell asleep. She woke up to someone lying in her bed, it was the owner. You keep yelling, I'll call the police and tell them you ripped me off. You better be nice to me and you'll have everything. Don't cross me. And he started running his hands over her body, kissing her. She wanted to scream, but for some reason she had no voice. When he had done his thing, he said, Wow, you were a girl. I thought there were no more girls like that. Well, good night for sure now. She was in shock. What was she going to do, how was she going to live? In the morning, he came to her again, but he asked for an apology and told her not to think about quitting. You either go to jail for stealing, which I'll make sure you do, or you stay here as my mistress. I like you very much. He left the room and left $500 on the table. As she left for the institute, she put that money on his desk with the words, I'm not a prostitute. Don't cross me. I didn't give you money for the night, I gave it to you so you wouldn't deny yourself anything. I understand that you're tight on money. So take it and do not suffer. He slipped the money into her pocket and went to get ready for work. Sarah did not go to the institute that day walked around the capital all day. If asked where she had been, she could not answer. She remembered nothing. Where her feet took her, that's where she went. She was afraid to go home and did not want to. She couldn't see Nicholas. She felt nauseous. But she came back in the evening. 
He was not yet home, which she was very glad of. She didn't clean up, but went straight to her room. She really wanted to sleep, but she was afraid to undress and lie down. So she sat dressed and pecked her nose at her textbook. He came to her room near midnight. Good evening, Sarah, he said kindly. Good evening, she replied softly. He began to hug her, trying to kiss her, but she pulled away and said, You are not pleasant to me. I do not want to have anything to do with you, much less intimate. I beg you, go away. And who are you to give your opinion? You're beautiful, sexy, but you're a cleaner. And you have no voice here. And walking over to her, he began to take off her jeans and underwear. Tears rolled from her eyes, and it turned him on even more. When she was already naked, Amelia's voice was heard from below, Colas. I'm here. He went downstairs and hugged and kissed his wife. You got here early? I wasn't waiting. Yes, there was nothing else to do there. Sign some very lucrative contracts, I think we'll do even better now. I always knew you were smart. Your mother, on the other hand, says you got me out of the dumpster. I'm begging you. Don't you know Catherine? She noticed that he didn't call her mom. Two days later, Sarah approached Amelia as she and her husband were having dinner and said, A friend came in from my town, passed me a letter from my mother. She's in the hospital, asking me to come over. What about the institute? We have a whole month plan air photo session. I have a lot of old photos, and we have a lot of places in town that give unlimited opportunities. I've made arrangements with Ginger, she'll come and clean the house while I'm gone. The whole time Nicholas was looking at her with squinted eyes, not taking his eyes off her. But she didn't even look in his direction, said, goodbye, and left to get ready. Half an hour later, she was already sitting on the bus, driving farther and farther away from this horror in Nicholas's image. The letter, of course, had not been sent by her mother, it had been written by the girls in her class. She could no longer see that face, and the thought that he would not appear in front of her for a month warmed her spirits. When she got home and saw her mother, she cried. How I've missed you, mommy. It's so good to be home and with you. I missed you, too. I must have tortured you with my calls. But not hearing your voice for a long time was beyond me. Although Sarah was far away from her abuser, there was no peace of mind. She decided to tell her mother how she had managed to escape home for an entire month, and warned her mother, if the landlord's eye clean for ask if you were really in the hospital, say you were. And you need me here to take care of you for now, don't forget, mommy. They chatted all day. In the evening my mother baked some delicious scones, and they sat down for tea. The doorbell rang, are you expecting someone, mom? No, everyone's home. When Sarah opened the door, the owner stood in front of her. You? Why are you here? Are you alone, is mom in the hospital? No, I'm not in the hospital, my daughter picked me up today and will take care of me at home. They took me to the hospital because I was alone. And now a helper is here. Who are you? I must say he was confused. He told Larry he was away on a business trip. He thought he'd stay with Sarah for a month while her mother was in the hospital. And here was the bummer. He was ready to strangle both his mother and Sarah for breaking his buzz. I'm the landlord of the house where your daughter mops the floors. I'm here to see if you need any help. He knew he looked like a complete idiot. Why on earth would he come to the floor washer to see if she needed help? Lawrence was a wise woman and, lest the man fall below the plinth in his own eyes, supported him. I thought rich people were all arrogant, that they didn't care about other people's troubles. And here is such attention. Sarah must have a special way of mopping your floors, to be so attentive to her misfortunes. He understood the mockery in the intonation and hurried away. What was that, little girl, her mother's eyes stared straight into her soul. You're not telling me something, I can feel it. She wasn't going to tell her mother anything, of course. Why should she? She couldn't help her anyway. No, mommy, it's all right. 
and that's why he came, to see if I was telling the truth or not. That's all. Don't worry about it. You did good. You did great. She went to her room, lay down on her bed, and fell into a peaceful sleep, knowing that it would not be disturbed until morning. Nicholas returned home in a bad mood. Tearing and thrashing. Nick, why did you come back, did something happen, asked Amelia. Nothing, I just didn't want to leave you for so long and was able to send another employee, the spouse lied. He'll give her a fun life when she gets back, he thought as he hugged his wife and fell asleep. A month flew by like one day. She did not want to leave her mother's house. She felt so peaceful here. She had done a good job, made beautiful papers, and knew for sure that the instructor would like them. She decided to ask the institute for a place in the dormitory. They promised her, but not until September, when the graduates had already left. It's okay, she reassured herself, there's not much time left, and then a place in the dormitory, just have to wait a little bit. Again the two of them cleaned up together with Ginger. She did everything so quickly that sometimes Sarah helped too. But when she left, Sarah's soul grew cold. It was as if Nicholas was standing around the corner waiting for her to come out so he could swoop in and pounce on Sarah. It was the same this time. She had just gone up to her room when he walked in on her and began his advances. When it was over, he said Sarah was like a log and left. For a few days, he didn't touch her, and those were the best days of her life. He overheard her talking to her mother on the phone, where she said she would move into a dorm after the vacations. And then she wouldn't have to spend two hours commuting. After hearing this, he popped into her room and started threatening again, if you leave my house, I can make it so that you will be expelled from the institute, and you will not be hired by any organization, understand? Sit tight. I understand, and I'll be glad if you do what you say. The hell with this study, as long as I don't have to see your face. He didn't hold back and slapped her. Know your place, scavenger, and shut your mouth. When Amelia arrived, she had already packed her suitcase, and came downstairs. Amelia, I won't be staying with you anymore, but until the end of the school year, I will come and clean. I won't be coming back to your place again starting in September. Where will you live, the woman wondered. I'll get a room for now, and they'll give you a dormitory starting in September. Wait, I'll give you some money so you'll have enough to rent a room. Thank you very much, good. Bye. Nicholas stood there, dumbfounded. He thought she had completely lost her fear. Sarah went to Ginger's dorm. She found the room quickly. It wasn't far from the institute, and she liked everything about it. Ginger helped her put everything in order, and the room was clean and comfortable. The school year was over, exams were taken. Sarah went to Amelia to get her check. The landlady gave her a good bonus in addition to her salary, and they said, Goodbye, like a stone fell from her soul as she slammed the door of that hated house. As she reached the gate, she began to feel sick and quietly began to slump to the ground. Amelia was called by a guard, saying that Sarah had fainted. When she woke up, she had a very painful headache, and a woman in a white robe was standing over her. She looked up, looked around, and realized that she was lying on the couch in the living room of the house from which she had been in such a hurry to leave. What's wrong with me? You need to come with us to the hospital, you'll get tested there, and we can tell you what caused your fainting. Can you get up and walk to the car? Yes, of course, I feel better now. As she rode in the car she wondered why she felt so dizzy. And she remembered that she'd only had tea today, she hadn't felt like eating it all this morning. Well, now it all makes sense why my legs are shaky. I'm just hungry. They took her to her room. She lay down and went right to sleep. They woke her up early and told her to go to the lab. After taking all the tests, Sarah lay there, resting and reading some kind of magazine. Then her eyes began to close and she fell asleep. She dreamt that she was pregnant and had a son named Michael. There was a man beside her, she could not see his face, and all the time he was hugging Sarah, playing with the baby, tossing him up, making her son laugh and his heart skip a beat as he flew upward. 
but he trusted the strong arms of the man who was tossing him up. Then suddenly the weather turned bad, the sky was covered with clouds, and it rained heavily. The man who had been by her side disappeared somewhere. She cradled her son in her arms and ran home. But someone's hands began to take the baby away from her, she screamed and cried for help, but Michael was taken away and taken away in a car. She ran after her, but never caught up. She opened her eyes. It was already dark in the room, she looked at the time, 2 a.m. What luck that this was a dream. She fidgeted for a long time before sleep took her in its strong arms again. In the morning there was a round, and the doctor, looking at her tests, said, Well, honey, you're going to be a mom soon. It is still very early, but at the end of April or the beginning of May there will be a new addition to your family. I don't see any joy on your face. No, I'm glad, it's just unexpected. I still have to deal with this information, make sense of it all, and then I'll be smiling. Okay, we can discharge you tomorrow. Should we let someone know to come get you? No, no, I'll get there myself. I feel fine. When the doctor left, she realized the horror of her situation. She was pregnant by that freak. God. I'm going to look at this baby and remember what a jerk his father is. Lord, tell me, what's the right thing to do? I thought once I left his house, everything would be forgotten and a new life would begin. But it turned out that I'll never forget him, because in front of me will be his offspring. Well, I could get an abortion. Tomorrow, I will consult a doctor. At night she dreamt of her mother and consulted her. What is this child's fault that you want to kill him? Children are not responsible for their fathers. It is a great sin to kill a child. God gave you a gift, and you want to get rid of it. Do you know how others ask God to give them children? And you, already having a new life in you, want to kill it. No, my daughter, don't do anything foolish. You may bitterly regret it later. When she woke up and remembered the conversation with her mother, she gave up the idea of an abortion. As she left the hospital, she saw Nicholas waiting for her. She wanted to sneak in unnoticed, but it didn't work. Wait, take your time. I want to talk to you. The doctor told me you're pregnant. I don't want a baby from you. Here's $2,000, find a good clinic and get an abortion, and spend the rest of the money on food, you'll need to regain your strength later. Do you understand me? She didn't argue with him. She wanted to get rid of him as soon as possible. All right, I understand you, that's what I'll do. So she's having her baby in April. That's good, she has time to finish her third year at the institute. And then the diploma. She won't have to go to school every day. My mom will come and help. We'll get through this, everything will be fine. Pregnancy went well. The baby did not cause much trouble. One day, Nicholas saw her from his car window. What a bitch. You didn't get an abortion, you lied, he got out of the car and caught up with her, what are you doing? I told you to get an abortion. Are you being brave now? She snatched her hand, which he was squeezing to the point of pain, fuck you. It's my baby, not yours, and I'll decide whether I get an abortion or not. But he wouldn't let up. Now I'll take you to a private clinic with a friend of mine, and he'll give you an induced delivery. Well, why not a cripple? Maybe it'll be a banker, an heir. My wife is giving birth to a banker, she's finishing her treatment right now. Come on, let's go and he started dragging her into the car. You want trouble? What do you mean? I could scream so hard right now that people would gather. The cleaner wouldn't care, but the banker would be embarrassed. Understand, I can't have an abortion. I have a RH conflict. With it, only the first pregnancy will be successful. That is why I was strongly advised to save it. She read all kinds of literature and the first thing that came to her mind was a RH conflict. He didn't even ask what it was. He just looked at her squeamishly, let go of her hand and wiped his palms with a handkerchief. It's not contagious, don't worry. She was already laughing. 
Slamming the car door, he drove off toward his wife. Nicholas saw Sarah a few more times, but never approached her again. He was sure she wouldn't say anything to his Larry, and he wasn't going to demand any compensation. Just in time she gave birth to a boy. There was no question of naming him, it would be Michael. She had to rent a room again because her baby boy, like all babies, cried loudly at night, and students should be studying, not listening to recitals. This time she couldn't get a room closer to the institute, but she was able to get a slightly cheaper one. She spent the $2,000 she had been given by her grief lover, grief daddy, and grief she remembered that time with disgust. The first thing she set aside was money for school, then three months' rent. And there was almost nothing left of that money. But she did have some on her card, it was the money she had been saving when she lived at Amelia's. Lawrence knew she had a grandchild. She and her daughter had agreed that she would come help in September, when Sarah needed to study. Don't you worry, little girl, I'll come see you at the end of August and you'll go study in peace. Everything will be all right, just as long as your health doesn't fail. Yes, thank you, mommy. I'll be waiting for you. But these hopes were not destined to come true. She was constantly bombarded with trials and hardships that she had to overcome. She was in a constant state of stress. Stress at university, stress at home. The neighbors were constantly complaining that the baby wouldn't let them rest. She was too tired to keep her body in survival mode. Sarah had forgotten what the joy hormone was, she had simply stopped producing it. Constant lack of sleep and weakness prevented her from working to her full potential. Wouldn't it be easier to die, she wondered to herself, why this struggle, pointless and exhausting, if there is no meaning to life? But at that moment her little boy would begin to grunt, and she would return to reality. No, she had to fight for the baby, for herself, finally, for life, or else, what was it all for? Michael was four months old. He was a giant. He was eating fine, sleeping better. Sarah, to keep him calm, began to feed him. From one day to the next, his mother was due to arrive. Lawrence packed two suitcases. She knew she was going away for at least six months. There was some anxiety in her soul, and she sat down, prepared her medicine just in case, and waited for her neighbor to give her keys. There was still time. She looked around her room, the flowers she loved so much, stopped at the picture of Sarah, and felt such pain in her heart that not only to drink the medicine, but to breathe, she had no strength. She clung to the back of her chair so she wouldn't fall, but it didn't help. She fell, hitting her head on a table leg, and died instantly. By the time a neighbor came running to get her keys, it was too late. An ambulance came and pronounced her dead. They called Sarah and told her to come and bury her mother. Good thing the baby was asleep at the time, not in her arms. Otherwise, she probably would have dropped him. She was ten years older all at once. Yesterday she was still a child, and today she isn't. There was her mother, and now there is no mother. Death is not something we want to think about, but it is something that awaits us all. And we have to deal with it on that basis. Sarah lay awake, it was night outside the window, thinking about her mother, was it painful for her to die? Or was it liberating? She asked questions she couldn't answer. Until it happened to her, she wouldn't know what happened after she took her last breath. In the morning, Ginger stopped by to see her. She offered to go with Sarah to help with the baby. But Sarah asked her to stay home with the baby and watch him here. It's hot outside. There will be a lot of people at the funeral, he doesn't need that kind of stressful situation. And Ginger agreed. Sarah had lost weight, was drained, sticking out only her nose and her eyes, with huge blue circles underneath them. When it was over, she was asked what would happen to the apartment, maybe she would sell it, no, I won't sell yet. I'm in such a state right now that I can't think straight. In a year, I will decide, the girl answered. She left the money with her neighbor to pay the rent and left for the capital city. What a good thing she had Ginger. Kind, cordial, understanding. She didn't have to say or ask for anything, she understood everything at a glance. She stayed with Sarah to help her through her mother's death. 
they took turns going to the institute. Knowing Sarah's situation, no one objected. She was an excellent student, talented. Everyone knew how seriously she took her studies, so they allowed the two students free attendance. The three of them went to their examinations. One took the exams, and the two waited in the hallway. That is how the girls passed all their exams. There remained the last, the main exam, the professional exam. It consisted of two parts, an oral exam in theory and practice. The rector's office of the institute rented the best exhibition hall, where the best students works on the theme of childhood, would be. Sarah had a lot of photos on this theme, but Ginger offered to give her personal photos when Sarah was nursing her son. Ginger took pictures of her. You can't see Sarah herself, just the baby and the mom's breasts. The pictures turned out great. Sarah came up with the caption for the photo, lunch break. Ginger was also among the top students. The exhibit was scheduled for June 1st. It was time to coincide with Children's Advocacy Day. Although Sarah did not remind Nicholas of herself in any way, he did not forget her for a moment. Hiring a detective, he instructed him to find out where she lived and to take some pictures of the child. A month later the detective brought the address and 20 photographs. He saw his son for the first time, what a handsome boy. Well done, Sarah, looking after the baby. He noted, though, that the stroller looked a little poor and he was dressed like the son of a cleaning lady. But I'll fix that, he said to himself. At the end of April, Sarah and Ginger wished Michael a happy birthday. There was one lighted candle on the cake and the child looked at the fire like a spellbound child. The day was overcast, chilly. It looked more like fall than spring. The girls made a real holiday for the baby. They bought balloons, wrote posters, pasted Michael's photos. He pointed at them with his finger and said, that's me. In the evening Sarah and her son went to see their friend off, but they didn't go far, the wind was blowing too hard. As they walked back to the driveway, someone behind her clamped her mouth shut and snatched the baby out of her hands. She turned and saw the man running away with her baby to the car. It was Nicholas Carr. The baby was screaming hysterically. He was terrified. She ran after the car, hoping to catch up to snatch her son Michael out of the hands of this scary man. She was drenched to the skin. She thought she might catch onto the door handle, but the wet pavement left her no chance. She fell, her knees and palms bleeding, but she couldn't get her baby boy back. Water was streaming down her face, and it was impossible to tell if it was tears or rain. She knew there was no use in going to the police, he already had an arrangement for everything, so, barely able to move her legs, she headed toward the house. So he did need the son of the cleaner, after all. Bastard, bastard, she cried and drank her tea. Tomorrow morning she would go to his house and tell Amelia everything. Early in the morning she drove to the house she had literally run away from two years ago. She knocked and rang, but no one opened the door for her. She started screaming so loudly that the neighbors came out, girl, you shouldn't be shouting like that, they left yesterday. Was there a child with them, a boy? There was a baby, I really didn't see who, girl or boy, though no. Amelia said, God, what a name Michael is, we should change it. Right. So it was a boy. He was crying very hard, I'd say he was hysterical. Nicholas was calming him down, and Amelia was putting a pacifier in his mouth. But the baby would spit it out. How long were they gone for, since they have a serious business here? Who knows them? Nicholas might come over, and, well, that's their business. Excuse me. I'm cold. And the neighbor ran into the house. So they kidnapped the child and managed to take it abroad. Money decides everything. She sat on the bench without energy and sat there until she was cold to the bone. She did not remember how she got home, how she lay down and fell asleep. Everything she did was automatic. I called Ginger and told her everything. She came right away and stayed with her friend all day. Ginger, why should I live? Without my son, I don't see the point. 
Maybe I should throw myself in front of a car or jump off a bridge. No, I'd rather jump off a bridge. That way I won't set a man up. She got up and began to dress quickly. Where are you going, Sarah? I'll be there soon. I'll come with you. No, you stay home. Maybe Michael will come back. Sarah, how can he come back if he's been taken away? I'm not letting you go anywhere. You hear me. She pulled her hat off, took off her coat, and tucked her into bed. She prudently closed the door. Let's go to sleep, dear. In the morning we'll decide what to do. Nicholas and Amelia had a villa in Cyprus. They had been building it for almost five years. They wanted a big family, so the house was not only beautiful, but also big, with a pool, gym and movie room. Nicholas and his wife went there once a year, their work required their constant presence, but Nicholas' mother, Catherine, was a frequent visitor. She loved to relax there. That is where they brought the small child. When Nicholas brought the boy home, his wife demanded an explanation. He told her everything, only exactly the opposite. His unhappy, honest, decent family man was seduced by a cleaning lady. She told him that she really wanted children. But young people now drink and smoke so much, and she wanted a healthy, intelligent man, and he was just the right man for all the parameters. He didn't want to, but she undressed in front of him, so he couldn't stand it. But it was only once, and she got pregnant right away. That's the fantastic story Amelia heard. And she didn't even try to shake off the noodles her beloved husband put in her ears. He persuaded her to take the boy, draw up documents, and raise him as her own. Especially since it was his son. The treatment didn't work, and they despaired of having children together. Amelia did not want to lose her husband, so with a heavy heart she agreed to take this child into her family. But she was concerned about the child's state of mind. He wasn't sleeping well, shaking all the time. She suggested seeing a good doctor. After examining the child, the doctor asked, Lately, has the child been experiencing some kind of shock, stress? He flinches all the time. Amelia spoke a foreign language perfectly, so she spoke to the doctor. Nicholas was present and only had time to move his gaze from the doctor to his wife. Yes, doctor, a madwoman tried to kidnap him. He was frightened, of course. Was she caught, punished? Yes, she's in jail. So the kid's healthy, tough. But the nervous system dash, and the doctor was silent. It takes time, patience, it should get better. Is he saying any words? Isn't he over a year old? No, doctor, he doesn't say anything. At first we thought maybe he couldn't hear. But we rattled a rattle and he turned around. So he heard. But he doesn't talk. It's all very sad, the doctor said. Love the baby, pay more attention to him. Let's see him in six months. But even six months later, Michael didn't speak. Only now his name was Edward, and Nicholas, like his mother, called him Ted in French. They had a weakness for abbreviating their names and making them sound French. Amelia insisted on getting a nanny. Her husband was often away on official business, and it was hard for her to take care of the child alone. Nicholas did not object. Amelia noticed that Ted liked to swim in the pool. He had a smile on his face at that moment and felt good. So three times a day, the babysitter swam with the child in the pool. Those were the happiest moments, and it seemed to Amelia that this was the moment when things would get better. But, the baby, would come out of the water and remain silent. She was getting restless, and sometimes she couldn't help it, she raised her voice at him, and tears started to flow from Ted. And his eyes said, I notice everything, I just don't say it yet. This immediately brought the new mother to her senses, and she took him in her arms and forced herself to kiss him. She could not yet bring herself to love this baby. She could not. Time passed, but nothing changed. Friends came to see them, admired the beautiful little boy, but when they learned that he did not speak, their interest in the child disappeared. They went with him to Germany, to a well-known pediatrician in the country. 
But he, like the previous doctor, said to wait, to love the child. He was under a lot of stress, things should get better. He was left with a nanny, and the young parents were away. Business demanded their presence. But they weren't staying in their home, but in an apartment that Sarah knew nothing about. Amelia called a housemate, Betty, hi, did someone come to see us? Have you seen? Your former au pair comes in every two or three days. Every time she knocks, she calls. Looking for her baby, she says, a Michael boy of some kind. I told her that you have gone abroad, but she with amazing persistence comes and waits. Let her wait. I know nothing about her child. When are you coming, the neighbor inquired. I think it won't be long yet. It's so warm here, I don't want to go to the cold capital. Well, okay, bye. Hello husband. That's why they didn't show up at their house, and made do just fine in the apartment, which was almost like home, huge and beautiful. Sarah went to that ill-fated house like she went to work. But the owners were gone. She was already giving up hope of ever seeing her son again. A major exam was approaching. She was decorating her allotted booth with her pictures. Opening tomorrow was also the exam. Prominent photographers and big fans of the art form were invited to serve on the jury. Sarah didn't even expect so many people. She stood outside her exhibit. She looked at Michael and cried. People came up and looked and not knowing that the author was standing with her back to them, said very nice words. There is life in these pictures. How well the light is chosen, the mood is felt. Well done, author. She, of course, was pleased to hear all this. At other times she would have jumped for joy, but not now. Hello, she heard behind her. Do you know the author of these pictures? That's something gorgeous. Sarah turned around and saw a man in his forties, elegantly dressed, wearing black-rimmed glasses that suited him very well. He was handsome. Sarah even smiled through her tears. Hello. The author is me. Why are you crying? It's personal, don't mind me. There are just as good works here, maybe even better. Look at those over there, and she pointed to an exhibition of Ginger's work. I've seen them before, and I've noted them to myself. The girl is really very talented. I liked everything about her. Yes, Ginger, knows a lot about photography. She's smart. The next day the results were tallied. First place went to Ginger, everyone was very happy for her, second place went to Donald, the guy did great work, and third place went to Sarah. All received prizes and cash prizes. Already at the exit Sarah was approached by that handsome man and introduced himself, I'm Charles. Congratulations on your graduation and welcome you to the restaurant. Thank you for the congratulations, but no, I don't feel like going to a restaurant. I'm sorry. I'm going home. You offend me, I sincerely want to congratulate you and offer a good job. Take it. The words about the job caught Sarah's eye, she really had to settle down somehow. If she could get her son back, she should have the means to raise him. So she agreed. They talked a lot about photography, as it is now fashionable. Especially the black and white photos turn out touching. Only at the restaurant did Sarah feel how hungry she was, and when Charles asked what you would eat, she said she was ready for anything. He smiled, he liked that answer. They ate seafood, he also ordered mussels. She looked at them with disbelief. Yes, you must try it, it's extraordinarily delicious. And Sarah, closing her eyes, swallowed. But she couldn't contain her emotions. Oh. This is divine. And they both laughed. It was the first time in two months. She was distracted from her heavy thoughts. Charles was a very interesting man. He knew so much about photography, as if he had graduated from an institute, not Sarah. She wanted to compliment him, but he got a text message on his phone. He apologized and started looking through the messages. It turned out to be a picture. He smiled at what he saw and said. A partner sent a picture of him and his son on vacation in Cyprus, he showed the picture to Sarah. 
She saw Nicholas tossing Michael up, and for some reason he wasn't laughing. Amelia stood beside him and clapped her hands. When Sarah saw the pictures, the champagne glass fell out of her hands and she started sliding off the chair. Charles rushed to her aid, carrying her outside, but she wouldn't come to her senses. Water was brought, Charles wiped her face, and she opened her eyes. He called for the waiters, paid and asked. Where can I take you? She looked at him with her huge ripe cherry eyes and was silent. Or rather, she tried to say something, but he could not hear a sound. She began to shiver, then he decided to take the girl to his house and we would sort it out there. In the car Sarah warmed up, her shivering stopped, and she thanked Charles. At home, he laid her on the couch, covered her with a warm blanket, and she fell asleep. She woke up when it was night outside the window, so he and Michael are in Cyprus. Why is my son so sad? He must be missing her. My dear boy, how I miss you too. She got up and came out of the room and saw that Charles was sitting and working at the computer. She walked over to him and said, Thank you, she apologized for spoiling the evening, Charles, can I see the pictures your friend sent again? Sure, here, take the phone and look. She went to her room and looked at her joy and tears dripped onto the phone, Sarah, you're going to break my phone like that. She flinched in surprise. No, don't worry, here you go, I already looked at it. I'm kidding, your tears are dripping right onto the phone. Yes, I'm sorry, Charles. Sarah, why are you crying looking at these pictures? Because that's my son, kidnapped by this man. What? Sarah, you and I are going to have tea now, and you will tell me everything in detail. Okay? She didn't even know herself why she agreed so quickly. It had been six months since Nicholas had brought his son to Cyprus. He could see that his wife didn't love the child as much as he would have wanted her to. She never kissed him, never hugged him. Ted was with the nanny all day. One day Amelia handed him an orange and asked, Would you like one? Yes, the child replied. She couldn't believe her ears that her son had said that. The wife called Nicholas and reported the happy news, Ted talked. He immediately arrived and decided to see for himself that his wife was not imagining things. Nicholas approached the baby, held out his hand and asked, Shall we go swimming? And the baby, stammering, barely said, Let's go. The fact that his child stuttered killed him, God, why put this trouble on a child's head? From that day on, my son began to speak, but he stuttered a lot. In order to say a word, the baby had to bend his head, twist his mouth, and constantly draw air. My wife yelled at the whole house, take him away, I can't stand to see him pushing. Nicholas was frustrated himself. He decided to go to the doctor again. The doctor remembered this baby. Well, how are you doing? Amelia told him that the child had begun to talk but had a very bad stutter. Is there any treatment for that? The doctor advised going to a speech therapist, but not a regular one, but one who treats stuttering. They have special techniques, it should help the child. From that day on the agony began. In addition to having to see a doctor three times a week with her child, Amelia also practiced at home the techniques the doctor showed her. She didn't want to do it, her insides were bubbling with anger. No love for Ted was out of the question. The speech therapist noticed this and said, It won't do any good. The child feels your hatred. He is afraid of you. This baby understands that he is unloved and is worried that he will do something wrong. Either you have to change your attitude toward the child or don't come to me anymore. I'd rather take another child in your place, with whom I can do more good. If you're not in class tomorrow, I'll take someone else. And if you come, be kind to the child, treat him with love. She didn't know how it was possible to force herself to treat with love someone who was unpleasant. The hell with it. Let him stutter, when he's older, I'll think of something or put him in an orphanage. And she happily dove into the pool. That evening they had a big fight with her husband. Nicholas insisted on further treatment, and his wife didn't want to do it anymore. 
Listen, a friend who lived next door told her, take him to his grandmother. My mother told me that I also stuttered as a child, the doctors could not help, and grandmother, something whispered, gave something to drink, and all like a hand removed. Where in Cyprus am I going to find a granny? They are everywhere. You know English, type on the internet and you'll find them. She did find a grandmother, but she lived far away. She took her babysitter with her and went to another city. The old woman looked at Amelia and said, give up what doesn't belong to you, and the baby will be healthy. And I won't be able to cure him. Go away, you bad man. The old hag. Amelia muttered to herself. She had another address, in the same town, and decided to try her luck. The grandmother examined the boy, looked at Amelia for a long time, and said, I'll try, but I'm not responsible for the result, you don't love this boy in the family, and he's suffering. At first Ted had an easier time talking. He stuttered, of course, but there were no such strong exertions. But after a month, it happened again, the same thing. Charles, listened intently to Sarah, did not interrupt her, only gave her tissues to wipe away her tears. Her nose was swollen and red from crying. She recounted everything in such detail, as if she had lived her life since she had left home. She was getting better, Charles gave her confidence. She felt his strength and protection. It was morning when Sarah finished her story. She was so tired, as if she had lived through those horrible moments of violence and child abduction once more. I don't believe my ears. I don't believe what you're telling me about my partner, a decent man, for a minute a great professional. Well, one doesn't preclude the other, Sarah shrugged, I understand it's hard to believe what I've told you, and I won't be offended if you say you didn't believe me. But that doesn't change anything. I know the baby isn't well there, he misses me as much as I miss him. But what can I do? I'm a mop in a word. Well, why do you make such a big deal about yourself? You're a photographer, a great professional. Yes, I think Shakespeare said, all the world is theater. Women and men are all actors in it. They have their exits, exits, and everyone plays more than one role. So at first I played the role of a nanny, then a cleaner, and now the role of a photographer. All this would be funny, when it would not be, so sad, so said the great Lermontov. I don't have any thoughts of my own today, I'm using someone else's. We'll think about what we can do, and in the meantime you need to get a job, buy a place to live, get back on your feet. To be a support for the baby. I told you yesterday about the job. Here's the thing. Photography is my hobby. As a big fan myself, I dabble and love to go to exhibitions, I have a magazine, it is only two months old, a young team of guys, work beautifully. The magazine is gaining momentum. So I suggest you work in this magazine. Yes, the magazine is called Lucky Shot. Work as a photo reporter for now. I'm not going to put you in the frame of any topic. You have great taste, choose your own subjects and bring them to the editorial office. You'll always have a full page, I'll tell that to the editor-in-chief. But you'll also have to add a short article to these photos, the author's view of the problem, so to speak. I am very interested in this work. I agree. Thank you very much, Charles. Thus began Sarah's new life and the preparation of the material basis for Michael's return. And in Cyprus, passions boiled over. Ted also stuttered. Amelia only came to him when Nicholas arrived. He was in the care of his nanny from morning till night. She hugged him, stroked him, felt sorry for him. This young woman saw that no one wanted the baby. When guests came over, the baby was sent to the back of the house with the nanny, so the guests wouldn't see these pushes when the baby wanted to say something. The baby did not yet understand that he was embarrassed, but his little heart felt that he was not loved. Once again Nicholas flew to the capital on business, Amelia let the nanny go, took the baby, and flew away, too. She found the orphanage, like a thief, sneaking onto its grounds. It was early morning. She put him on a rock and told him to wait for her here. The child nodded. In his jacket pocket she put a note, Ted Shirley, age 2. She kept her new name, but gave her maiden name. 
and she ran away. That way she won't find him for a long time, thought the cheerful lady as she flew back to Cyprus. The child was spotted by a woman carrying laundry. Without getting anything out of him, she took him to the head of the orphanage. A few days later Nicholas arrived, he did not even sense the absence of the child at first. It wasn't until the morning that he asked, Where's Ted, I don't see him. And you won't see him again. I gave him to an orphanage. I'm ashamed to show him to my friends and acquaintances. No children of my own and I don't want that. What have you done, you fool? You should have given him to his mother then. And now it turns out that with living parents the child ended up in an orphanage? Why do I have to give the child to that slut? She seduced my husband, wiggled her naked ass in front of him, and I have to thank her for that and give her a baby on a silver platter? And after she had shoved her figure under his nose, he slapped her on the cheeks for the first time in years, and smashed her nose. She was frightened out of her wits. She had never seen Nicholas like that before. Turns out he was scary when he was angry. You're going to go and bring the baby back. I wouldn't think of it. I'd rather leave you. Go away, but give me back my son. Look for him yourself, if you find him, you're lucky. That night Nicholas drank like hell and decided that tomorrow he would start looking for his son. Life had prepared other trials for him. Another stressful time in little Ted's life was not in vain. He stopped talking again and lay in bed all the time. A doctor came and examined him. The baby is good, healthy, look how groomed he is. He is used to another life. It's stressful. It is good that he did not go anywhere. He seems to be obedient. They told him to sit and he did it. We'll wait. He will get used to it a little and maybe he will talk. But the miracle did not happen. He did not speak. Amelia didn't leave Cyprus, lived on her own and didn't think about the baby. It should have been done a long time ago, not tortured with this freak, she reassured herself, drinking a glass of juice in the morning. Nicholas wanted to start looking for his son the next day, but he got a call from the firm saying they were in trouble. He immediately flew out to the capital. He was expecting a blow from this side, but he didn't expect it so quickly. Eight months ago, he decided to give up his airbag. He invested all of his money into a very tempting project. Everything was going great. He even went so far as to cash and funds from dubious transactions for a handsome percentage. The volume of such transactions was enormous. The money was easy, and it was exactly what was supposed to help if financial reserves were needed. But the IRS detected and quickly figured out the whole chain of withdrawals of very dubious money and blocked those funds. He didn't have the finances to fix the deficiencies and save the business. It was threatening to collapse. He ran to Charles. Help me out, the business is on the verge of extinction, lend me some money. Nicholas I have them all in business. You know I started a magazine, some of the money went there. I won't be able to help out this time. He had no one else to go to. And he didn't want everyone to know about his predicament. He decided to mortgage the house, and when the business leveled out, he would buy it back. Without telling Amelia anything, he mortgaged their mansion. The money he got helped get his head out, but his tail got stuck. They started dragging him around the IRS, for withdrawals. His wife had acquaintances in the IRS, and he had to call her, come over, business is cracking at the seams, we'll be left without pants. This was serious. Forgetting about her broken nose, she flew out to help her husband and the business. She had to run around and give a decent amount of money so that the head of the company would not be prosecuted, and would only be fined. After that the check stopped, but they had to stop cashing out dubious funds. It was a shame to give up such easy money. But in this case, they had to choose the lesser of two evils. This time the lightning flashed, but the thunder did not strike. Nicholas got off with a heart attack and spent a week at home under medical supervision. They decided to live in the capital, so they could control their work. There was no hurry to Cyprus now. The child was not there, so it was safe to stay in the apartment. 
Nicholas thought about his son all the time and did not know how to approach the problem. He decided to talk to his wife, to ask her forgiveness for having offended her. He wondered what gift to surprise her with to tell her where the baby was. She missed her husband, too. She loved him, after all. So she was looking for any excuse to make up. And it didn't take her long to find one. Charles came to visit them. They were glad to see him. They laid the table, put on some good wine brought from Cyprus, and had a very cordial evening. Charles inquired, Where is your baby boy? You haven't heard from him all evening? Show me your treasure. Nicholas looked frightened at his wife, and she, thinking quickly, replied, We sent him and his nanny to a sanatorium, let them rest, gain strength. For how long? Yes, they've just left, they've got a two-term pass. It's a pity I didn't get to see the baby. Well, next time you'll tell me all about it. After saying, goodbye, he left his partner's apartment. Sarah plunged headlong into her work. At home, she made a list of topics that would be of interest to magazine readers. She went on field trips, traveling to various parts of the world. They brought back wonderful material that was an ornament to the magazine. Her pictures complemented the articles, which were introductory and readers loved it. She had a wonderful relationship with her co-workers. She was active in her work. And what baby models she had. Just a sight to behold. She would go to the park, sit on a bench and work. The pictures came out alive because the children weren't posing, they were just living, walking, crying, fighting, and hugging. It was these works that readers liked the most. After working for a month and receiving her first paycheck, she also received a bouquet of flowers from Charles and a beautiful card with lovely words, I want to congratulate the man who is endowed with the gift of preserving life's most joyful and exciting moments. I wish you bright flashes, successful lighting, creative ideas and only happy faces in the frame. Don't stop there, dare, seek. Inspiration does not visit the lazy. An admirer of your talent, Charles. It was very nice and touching. But coming to the empty apartment, the mood dropped to zero, she remembered her little boy. She imagined how big he was now, and how good it would be for the two of them. She was living out her last month in her rented room. After selling her mother's apartment, she looked for a two-room apartment in the capital. It was a lot of money, so she took out a small loan for a year and a half and expected to manage the debt in time. She never forgot about her son. Her former owner's house was closed and still no one lived there. When she met Charles, she asked him when Nicholas and his wife and child would be arriving from Cyprus. Charles did not want to tell her at first that they had arrived long ago and were living in the capital. Only Michael was not with them, Sarah would be worried, crying, but nothing could be changed yet. And he doesn't know how to help. He has some thoughts on this, of course, but we have to wait until the baby comes back and then act. So he told Sarah that they are back, but Michael is in the sanitarium with the nanny, as soon as they get back, he will be sure to tell her. And Nicholas walked around his wife, complimenting her and telling her he loved her like he did the first day he met her. Amelia understood what he wanted, pretended to be pleased to hear it. By the way, she was really pleased, but she wasn't going to tell him where the baby was. She didn't want to see him in her house again, much less give him to that molesting bitch of another man's husband. Darling, why do you need this child? We are so good together. Well, God did not give us children, he knows better whether we need children or not. You understand, it is not the child's fault that his mother is like this, why he is suffering in this orphanage. He should be treated and taken care of. And no one will do that there. Look, I'm sick of you whining. I said no, and don't bother me anymore. Things were not going well at work, and thoughts of the baby, for a while, took a back seat. But he did not give up the idea of returning to this issue. Three months passed. Nicholas' anniversary birthday was approaching. Catherine arrived, Charles came, the Jubilee's friends with their wives. A host was invited to make it a truly unforgettable celebration. Michael Charles never got to see him. 
He didn't want to ask Nicholas in front of his wife, but asked him when they went out on the balcony for air. You are hiding something from me about my son. Why don't I see him with you? Has something happened to him? There was no help for Nicholas, and he looked back apprehensively and said that his son was no longer with them and he did not know where he was. After this answer, Charles had more questions, but Amelia sensed that her husband might say something unnecessary and took Nicholas away to dance. Charles had no further opportunity to talk to Nicholas alone. Charles decided to talk frankly with Nicholas at work. No one would disturb them there, and he would hear the truth about the baby, not what Amelia was saying. Calling his partner into his office, he began without any detours. Look, I understand that there is something mysterious going on in your kingdom that should not be known by those outside your royal family's circle, but you've let me in on your secrets yourself. And I have learned that you have had a child by some miracle, though you and your wife have been going at it for a long time, but, as far as I know, without success. Where did the child come from, Nicholas? And Nicholas started the same record he'd been putting on for his Larry. If he had known that Charles had known everything long ago, he would not have embarrassed himself so much in front of a friend who had thought him, until recently, a decent man. When he got to the point where the seductress herself wanted a child with him and he was right for her, Charles interrupted him. I don't want to accuse you of lying, at these words Nicholas stared at him in surprise and already opened his mouth to object, but his friend prevented him from doing so, I will tell you that I know the whole truth. From the beginning to the end. So please don't make me think that from this day forward, I'll have one less friend. What makes you think I'm not telling the truth? Sarah told me everything. And you don't suppose that? No, I don't. Because the moment she told me that, she didn't have to make excuses or hide anything. She was just telling me about her life. And now you're looking for excuses for your bastard behavior. I even told Sarah at that moment that you were a decent man, and I find it hard to believe what I heard. Nicholas sat with his head down and gathered his thoughts. I don't have to answer to you, of course. And I could tell you to go to hell, but I won't do it just because you might help me find the baby. I'm not making excuses for myself. It's true that I was a jerk, but I really liked Sarah at the time, and I didn't think she'd fight back. But when she said she didn't want anything to do with me, including sexually, I freaked out. So I pressured her and intimidated her. How it ended, you know. Nicholas, where is the baby? I really don't know where it is. Amelia said she put him in an orphanage. What? An orphanage? What are you, animals? How could you let your son be put in an orphanage? I didn't allow it. I wasn't even home at the time. She did everything without me. And when I got there, he was gone. Well, she didn't just put him there, did she? No, it wasn't that easy. Apparently, when I took the baby away, it was a lot of stress for him, a fright call it what you want, and he stopped talking. At all. And then when he started saying something, he started stuttering in a terrible way. That's what she couldn't stand. I should probably add, with your acquiescence. Yeah, you're probably right. But when I found out the kid was in an orphanage, I even beat her up. But she still wouldn't tell me which orphanage she gave the baby to. I've already called several orphanages, some have told me there is no such thing, and others have refused to provide any information. Should I talk to Amelia? Can I convince her? And if you can't convince her? Then I'll resort to your method of pressure and intimidation. The main thing is, do you mind? No, I'm ready to do anything, take the child and give him to his mother. That's all? What else am I supposed to do? Apologize. Help out financially. Isn't that your responsibility? I'll think about what you said. So we're looking for Michael together? I forgot to tell you, we changed his name to Ted. Why? We didn't like the name his mother gave him. Didn't you think about whether you had the right to do that? You put too much faith in your Larry. Even where it crosses the line. You disappoint me, Nicholas. 
All right, let's find the baby first, and then you can lecture me. One more question for you, how do you know Sarah so well that she's laid out her whole life for you? It's a long story. And I'll be sure to tell you, but in short, I was on the committee that determined the winners in the photography thesis. And Charles began to think through the conversation with Amelia. He decided not to tell Sarah anything yet. He went in to talk to Amelia when Nicholas wasn't home. I knew it, my husband's tongue was too long. He can't keep a secret. Amelia, it's not a secret, it's a crime. Putting a child in an orphanage just because he stutters is monstrous, don't you think? No, I don't think so. It made me sick to watch him sweat. So why didn't you give him to his mother, who is still killing herself over the absence of her son? At the same time you would have corrected the monstrous mistake of kidnapping him. No way, give him to his mother. She'll seduce my husband, and I'll seduce her child. No, let her suffer and think about her behavior. And you believed your husband that she was the one who seduced him? Or was that more comfortable for you? Yes, you're right, it was more comfortable for me. Or rather, it was more comfortable for my ego. So what? What difference does it make who seduced who? The fact is, he's a handicapped child. He'll never be able to talk normally. And who made him so handicapped? It wasn't you and your husband, was it? Anyway, what are you here for? To lecture me on what's good and what's bad. Consider that I listened to it with great pleasure, and now I have to leave, in the salon waiting for me. I see you don't understand anything. Then it will be as follows. Tomorrow, no today I write a statement to the prosecutor's office about the missing child. That the child was, will confirm the photos you kindly sent me from Cyprus. You will not flee the country, as you will be put on the list of people the investigation services are looking for. But your torment will not end there. All of your beauty salons, a week later closed for inspection, I will find the reason and half of them, after checking will not open because of non-compliance with the requirements. That's enough for now. If that's not enough, I know what else can be done but I advise you not to get to that point. Otherwise you won't go up again. Is that clear? Fuck you. I'm not the shy type. All right, we'll see about that. See you later. Why do you care so much for this girl? She's going under you, too, isn't she? Then she's going to ask for something soon. He looked at her squeamishly and went out. She lied about not being squeamish, of course. Her legs were shaking, and she was scared out of her wits. She didn't want to go to the salon. She had to think about the situation. And all because of this Colas. She had not believed him, of course, when he had told her what a treacherous way the rascal had seduced him. By and large, she liked Sarah. But she liked her husband better. He had always been a hunter of other men's bodies. She knew this one, she had seen it with her own eyes several times. But he didn't know what she knew. Amelia's reasoning had always been that if he knew she was aware of his cheating, then she would have to make a decision either leave, or tolerate, turning a blind eye to everything. There was no third option. So Amelia wouldn't tell her husband that she knew about his antics. He was a walker, of course, but not often. In the last four or five years, it had only been Sarah. I guess age had taken its toll after all. She could forgive her husband, she couldn't forgive Sarah, not for sleeping with her husband. It was the fact that she had been able to have a baby that God had not given her. What made the situation worse was Catherine, forever rebuking her sister-in-law for her inability to bear children. These were the sins of her youth, when, at age 15, she became pregnant by a classmate. And although the boy promised to marry, her parents took her to an abortion. From then on, the countdown went in the opposite direction. Her husband didn't know about it and sent her everywhere for treatment, but it didn't help. She forgave him. But what was she to make of Charles's warning? Amelia knew him as a very serious, well-connected man. He could ruin their lives. She would have to wait for her husband and then decide what to do. 
Looking through the bottles of alcohol, she chose the bottle with the strongest contents, drank it in a gulp, and decided to smoke. This was the state in which she was caught by Nicholas, who had come from work. Sarah was fixing up her new apartment. With each paycheck she bought something she needed in the apartment and was happy about it, like a child. Gradually, the apartment took on the appearance of a beautiful living space. She wasn't desperate to find a son, so she set up a nursery in which her Michael's beautiful eyes looked out at her from all the walls. She had no idea that her Michael had long since been named Ted. Charles hadn't told her anything yet, and she wasn't comfortable bothering him with the same questions every time either. He knows everything himself, and if there's any news, he'll be sure to tell her, Sarah thought. She worked hard, taking beautiful pictures. She had clients who wanted pictures from this particular master. She wished she had reported the child's theft, maybe they could have helped after all. Or maybe it wasn't too late. And what will she say to the question, why did we wait a year and a half? She will tell the whole truth, there is no other way. Her thoughts were interrupted by the doorbell. Well, at last I can see what kind of nest you bought yourself, with a noise Charles rushed into the apartment with flowers and gifts. This is for you, he held out a beautiful bouquet of roses, this to drink tea, he put a huge round cake on the table. When she opened it, it said, happy housewarming. And this is a combine for you in the kitchen, let the appliances and electricity plow in your place. Maybe you remember, there was a song like this, electricity will plow and sow for us, I don't remember the rest. It's so good that you came. We'll have tea now. Maybe you want something to eat, I have some delicious soup. No thanks, just tea. Well, all right. He walked into the nursery, and his heart ached with pity for this little man who had persevered through all the hardships of the foolish adults. That's all right, little one, I'm sure you'll be with your mama soon and God and mama will help you get over all this horror soon enough. You probably think you can't be loved because you're bad and stutter, but you're not. Bad adults who put their ambitions ahead of the health of such a wonderful baby. How do you like the nursery for your son? Wonderful. All so lovingly done, well done. And your pictures, as always, are gorgeous. He sensed that she was waiting for news from him. But he could not tell her anything yet, so he tried not to look in her direction unnecessarily. Sarah sensed this and prayed to God that he would keep quiet, not because the news was bad, but because it just wasn't there. So there the two sat, drinking tea and understanding each other with half a glance. Charles, do you think if I go to the police now and report a child stolen, will they believe me? Before they believe you, they'll ask a thousand questions that you'll have to answer. Are you ready? I am ready. Because I will tell only the truth. That's good. But the police, the courts, are the kind of organizations that will demand evidence and witnesses right away. You don't have either, am I right? Almost. I have something. A birth certificate, Ginger will tell all. What can Ginger tell you? Just from your word something? It's not evidence. You understand, Sarah, I don't mind you going to the police, I mind you not being made guilty afterwards. But if you do decide to go, I'll help you get a lawyer. A good lawyer. You go with him, so you don't get hurt. So it's up to you. But first, I want to ask you to wait a week, maybe you won't have to go anywhere. You've waited so long, just wait a little longer, honey. Okay? Okay. Do you know anything about the sun? Do you have any news? I don't want to tell you half news, in a week, you'll get the full picture, trust me. She was so touched by his concern, so she couldn't help herself and hugged him and said, thank you. Come on, I haven't done anything yet. Everything will be all right. And there was a scandal in the kingdom of crooked mirrors. The wife was accusing her husband of betrayal. Why did you tell Charles that I had given the baby to an orphanage? Because you did everything without my wishes. This is my son and you owed it to me to tell me of your decision. You did what you did, like. Well, well, finish it off, insult me. You yourself were glad not to see him again. You yourself sent him and his nanny out the backyard, away from the guests. 
Only you were afraid to admit it, and I wasn't. I made the decision for me and for you. You wanted it, too. You're just a coward. Have you said everything? Now listen to me. Give the baby back, and we'll forget everything like a bad dream. I'm having trouble in business again. How already? He said in a week. Who said? Charles came by, put on so much fear, but I thought he was joking. He promised an inspection of my salons. That's what you've done. The fool is abroad. Tell me where the child is, and I'll go get him myself. No need, I'll go to that orphanage myself tomorrow. I'll see if he's already been adopted. That would be the worst case scenario for you. Then you won't escape the collapse of your business anyway. Already at night, when his wife had fallen asleep, Nicholas called Charles and said that tomorrow his wife would go to the orphanage. You have a chance to follow her car. All right, at 8 o'clock sharp the car will be at your house. Nicholas left for work in the morning and asked his wife to call about the results of her trip. All right, I'll call you as soon as I know anything. But she wasn't going anywhere, she decided to tell her husband that Ted was adopted. She took a bath, lay all foamy for two hours, then drank coffee. Then she sat down at the computer and hung there for three hours. She came to her senses when Nicholas called. Why don't you call me? I'm worried. Yeah, just driving home in the car and wondering how to tell you so you don't worry too much. No Ted. The supervisor said he was adopted by foreigners in a month and taken away just the other day. But I think he'll be cured abroad and he'll be fine there. Don't worry, Nick. He immediately called Charles and told him the results of the trip. I did what I could, but they took the boy away. Taken away where? Your wife never left the house. She lies to you and you let her do it. My boys are still standing outside your house, and so is your wife's car from last night. Are you telling me the truth? Exactly. Here, tell your Larry that I'm the one who did the best I could, but she thinks I'm kidding. I don't like to be taken for a fool. She's your wife, you can take it, but I won't, and he passed out. When Charles came into his office, he was drunk out of his mind. Have you been drinking again? You've been dabbling in alcohol a lot. He somehow smiled pitifully and said, Alcohol is an anesthetic for an operation called life, he dropped his head on the table. He did not go home, but spent the night in his office. And in the morning Amelia got a call from her salon saying they had an inspection. The salons were closed, inspections were going on everywhere. Amelia wished she had gone to the orphanage yesterday, as she had promised. Quickly dressed, she flew to rescue her business. But she saw entirely new people, mostly men, who refused to be nice to her and clearly performed their duties. She began calling Charles, but he was unavailable. She reached Nicholas and asked where Charles was. He's working. He's in the office. Yes. I'll go to him now. It's no use. He's forbidden to let you into the company. Why did you deceive me by saying you went to the orphanage? You broke the child's life, yourself and me. Three parlors closed, saying they would come tomorrow to finish the job. The next day, early in the morning, the firemen showed up. They made an injunction. One of the salons was blocked with broken chairs and some other junk, the evacuation exit. The other salon's door was swinging inward, but it should be outward. And they already had an order to fix it. Impunity corrupts, so Amelia spit on that injunction, as she spit on others, always hoping to pay them off, but not this time. With Nicholas, they quarreled again. But she gave him her word that tomorrow morning she would definitely go to the orphanage. Knowing that she could do nothing to help her salons now, she decided to go to the child. At night Nicholas called Charles again, she said for sure she would go to the orphanage tomorrow. That's what I thought, she figured she could only joke with you, but not with me. All right, I'll send the boys over. At exactly 9 o'clock in the morning, she left the house. The boys followed her. It took about two hours to get there, and she was a little tired. 
because she had been too relaxed yesterday, she had been drinking and stoned, so her head was heavy and her face was all crumpled up. As she drove up to the orphanage, she went straight to the headmistress. To what do I owe, the supervisor asked. I want, or rather my husband and I want, to adopt a child, a boy preferably. The age of two, maybe a little over two years. Are there any such children? Of course there are. And there are those, and older. Unfortunately, there are a lot of unfortunate children. Let me see your documents. Here, please, my passport. You're quite old, and you still don't have children of your own? No, God doesn't give us children. Well, come on, let's go to the group before they go for a walk, take a look. And she led her down long corridors, where in some places the paint on the walls was peeling, past the kitchen, where she absolutely disliked the smell. Here we are. Hello, children. Amelia began to look at the children and immediately saw Ted among all of them. The children stood quietly looking at the strange aunt. Suddenly Ted came up to her and hugged her legs. Apparently he still remembered her and recognized her, but he could not say anything. Amelia's legs buckled and she sat down on a chair. And Ted put his head on her lap, then looked at her with his kind baby eyes, moved his lips, but there was no sound, she stroked him on the head and the baby went back to the children. And then all the other children also ran up to the strange aunt, and everyone wanted to lie down on her lap. Then the manager and the teacher took the children away and put them on the carpet on the floor. Tears streamed down Amelia's face and she ran out of the group, leaning against the wall and crying. The headmistress took her under her arm and led her to her office. These children are looking for a mother's affection, and every time some people come and gives them hope that happiness is possible and that their mother will find them. It's very hard to watch. And it's impossible to get used to it. In the office Amelia drank some water and asked to tell about the boy who approached her first. It's a strange story, the supervisor began the story, for months ago we found him sitting on a big rock. He had his hands in his jacket pockets and in one he clutched tightly a little note that said his name, last name and age. The baby is beautiful, clean, so well groomed. What an asshole you would have to be to abandon a child like that. Everyone loves him very much. He's bright, and if he talked, he would have been adopted a long time ago. That's the only thing that scares the adoptive parents, she finished her story. Don't give this child away to anyone, we will adopt him. We have the opportunity to take him abroad and cure him. My husband and I will come together. Amelia said firmly. Okay. I'll wait a month, if you're not there and there are new people who want to adopt, we'll give the baby away. The boys gave Charles the address of the orphanage and drove back. All evening Nicholas and Amelia talked about Ted. Shall we take him back? No, Amelia, that won't work. Charles has probably already told Sarah everything. She might make a scandal, and you and I are in trouble everywhere. Maybe they'll take the house away, too, if I don't solve the problems. What house? What are you talking about, she didn't understand the woman. I'm talking about problems in the business. To make things a little better, I mortgaged our house. Why? Easier to sell in Cyprus. We go there so seldom. We built it for a big family, and it never was, and it never will be. And there won't be, will there? Go ahead and sell the house in Cyprus. Okay, Nicholas replied. In the morning, the unfulfilled papa told Charles everything he knew about Amelia's trip. What do you intend to do now? I'll tell Sarah everything today and we'll go get the baby. Yes, Charles, Amelia told me that she gave him up as Ted, and she wrote her maiden name as Shirley. Then she was mad at me, at Sarah, at Ted, and she did it so that Sarah would take longer to find him or she would never be able to find him at all. Now you know everything, act on it. You've got a mean one, Colas. And Charles drove to Sarah's house. Sarah saw through the window as Charles drove up, and her heart raced so that she sank back in her chair without strength. She remembered that she had felt the same way when she was informed of her mother's death. 
she slowly made her way to the door and opened it a little before Charles could press the bell. Are you not feeling well? I've never seen you so pale before. What's the matter? Nothing yet. I think you've come with some news, only I can't tell if it's good or bad. Charles, to reassure her, said at once, I came with good news, even very good news. After these words he barely had time to pick her up, otherwise she would have collapsed on the floor and who knows how she would have landed. Well, what are you scaring me for, Sarah, how are you? Calling an ambulance? No, I feel better now, give me a drink. Drinking a full glass of water in a gulp, she lay down on the couch and said, Tell me. Now I won't fall down. And he began his story from the moment little Michael was kidnapped. During the story, she would sit down, then lie down again, drink water and cry. And Charles kept telling the story. When he reached the orphanage, she grabbed his arm and yelled, Let's go get him, Charles, will you get up? Take your time, it's not that simple. The baby was turned in there under a different name and surname. And the fact that it's your son will have to be proved. I'm afraid you'll have to do DNA and not just any test, but you'll have to ask to expand the panel of test markers to prove that you are the biological mother and thereby increase the accuracy. Also, you may not be able to have the baby because you are alone without a husband. If such a problem arises, we can register a sham marriage to give you the baby. But I want to tell you right away that I like you, and I suggest you marry me nicely. Charles, you're wonderful. And I like you, too. But right now my mind is all about the baby. Sarah, as strange as it sounds, but your marriage is part of those thoughts about the baby, too. You might not get it. Okay, I get it, when are we going to the orphanage? Let's do it tomorrow morning. Get your papers ready, Michael. Take a picture of the two of you together. Take that short film of his birthday. Take your time, and we'll pick you up with a lawyer at 9 o'clock sharp. Otherwise, you're gonna make a mess, we're gonna get kicked out of there. Thank you very much. God sent you to me for all my suffering. See you tomorrow. She didn't sleep a wink all night, she had too many fantasies in her head that kept her awake. What had he become? She hadn't seen him in almost a year and a half. Would he recognize her, approach her, or hide behind the children? My boy, how I long to see you soon, to hold you close to me. I am very sorry for you. I didn't fight for you, I let those horrible people take advantage of my indecision and separate you and me for a long time. I should have run to the police, shouted, drawn attention, but who was I then, a scavenger, a poor student with no one to stand up for her. I will beg your forgiveness, my good man, and you will feel how much I love you, and you will forgive your mother her sin. With that she went to sleep. At exactly 7 o'clock the alarm clock sounded, but only a shower could wake her up finally and bring her to her senses. At 9 o'clock they were on their way to the orphanage. Charles warned Sarah that the lawyer would speak, he was in the know and would do everything right and according to the law, you sit and listen and, if asked, answer the questions. Don't be in a hurry to run to look at your son. In fact, to the headmistress, he's someone else's child with a different first and last name. Do you understand, Sarah? I get it, Charles, don't worry, I won't ruin the meeting. She was shaking and her hands were as cold as ice. So the three of them entered the orphanage and headed for the superintendent. Oh, what a large delegation has come to see us, come in, have a seat, the manager kindly offered. The lawyer presented his papers, then Sarah and Charles showed the papers. When the official part was over, the manager got ready to listen. The lawyer began. After telling everything from beginning to end, he asked Sarah to show a picture, a little film from his birthday party, and the superintendent, surprised, said, so that's Ted. And Sarah still snapped, that's not Ted, that's my Michael. But Charles quickly brought her to her senses. The supervisor asked so many questions and when she asked the last one, who brought the boy into the orphanage, Sarah wanted to shout again, but Charles squeezed her hand hard and she remained silent. That, unfortunately, we don't know, the lawyer replied. 
that was what Nicholas had asked to say, very much so, not to cause them any more trouble than they had. Although all the problems were their own fault. And may I see the child, I haven't seen him for a long time, asked Sarah. The manager felt sorry for the young mother, but she could not just give up her child either. The mother shows a child who looks like Ted, but says it is Michael. The mom's last name on her passport is Murphy and Ted is Shirley. The lawyer saw the supervisor's doubts and suggested a DNA test. Have your healthcare provider and your child come to the clinic and have Michael and his mother take the biomaterial. Your healthcare provider will be present, is that okay, with you? Okay, she replied, so I would feel better, and I also want to tell you that a woman came by yesterday, she liked Ted too, and I promised her that I wouldn't give this baby to anyone. What are you talking about? The lawyer began, Sarah is not just one of the people who wants to adopt, she is the mother of that child. Yes, of course you're right, the baby is always better off with his mother. Can I see him? Sarah went back to that request again. Yes, let's go, and you, she turned to the men, wait in the study or you can get some air out, and they went into the group. The children were playing and were not paying attention to those who entered. Hello, children, the supervisor said loudly. As if on cue, everyone said hello, stood up, and looked at the strange aunt again. She saw Michael at once. How grown up, how handsome he has become. He hasn't changed much. Just grown up. But the child did not come to her, but stood looking at his aunt, like all children. He has forgotten me, Sarah thought sadly. She was about to leave when the little girl came up to her and asked. Are you my mother? Will you take me away? Sarah looked to the caregiver and the supervisor for support, and they came to her aid. No, it's not your mom, we're looking for your mom, if we find her, she'll definitely come for you. Okay, the child said quietly and headed toward the children. It was agreed that tomorrow a nurse would drive up to the hospital to take the baby's biomaterial. The nurse came again for the result, the lawyer and Sarah were present. The result showed that Sarah was Michael's biological mother. But the supervisor hinted to Sarah that it would be better if she got married first, so it would be easier to raise the child. I get a fine salary, bought a two-bedroom apartment. The baby will have his own room. And getting married, I'll get married when I see fit, Sarah was worked up. She thought she would never get her baby boy. Anyway, the supervisor told the child welfare authorities to come and check everything, as soon as I got a report from them, you could take the child. Sarah was afraid of these agencies, she had heard so much negative things about them, so the witness would not hurt, especially such an experienced lawyer. The paperwork was received, the report was written, and she could go to get her son. The car is going very slowly, the road is clear, why are we dragging along like this? We're not weaving, we're going 100 km per hour, Charles replied, sit back and don't be nervous. An hour later they pulled up at the orphanage. Sarah ran to the supervisor. She took her time checking all the paperwork, photocopied it, and put it all in a folder labeled Ted Shirley, with Michael Murphy in parentheses. Well, that's it now, you can take your son, she led her into the group. Michael was standing by the window playing with some girl. She was combing his hair and he was smiling back at her. Michael. Sarah called out to him, but he didn't respond. He forgot that name, he was too young then. He's been called Ted for almost a year and a half now. And I don't want to call him Ted, replied Sarah sharply. Mommy, you're very excited, and I may not give you the baby until you get your nerves straightened out. She didn't like her, Sarah certainly didn't. She seemed a little twitchy. How's the baby gonna be with her? I'm fine. I wish I could believe that. Maybe tomorrow you can take the baby? Calm down, and he'll be more comfortable. No, today. Why can't I take my son? You are provoking me by procrastinating. I've already been separated from him for almost a year and a half. Tears came to my eyes, and the supervisor gave in. Not to call him Ted, she walked over, took the child by the hand, and led him to Sarah. Sonny, let's go home, there are toys waiting for you. 
But he ran away from her, took the hand of the girl he was playing with, then Sarah, and was ready to leave the group. He became friends with that girl. It was always the two of them playing together. She's a round orphan, her parents died in a plane crash. She had a grandmother, but she died. Olechka, come, you will play with the children, and your friend will go home. This is his mother. But Michael wouldn't let the girl go and started crying. Let's do this, they're going for a walk now, that's when you pick him up. Okay, I'll wait outside. Michael was one of the first to come out, Sarah immediately got him in the car, and they drove home. He didn't cry in the car, kept looking out the window and pointing his finger at things that interested him. Sarah couldn't believe they were together again. As they drove up to the house, Charles wanted to go in with Sarah, but she didn't invite him in, and he didn't want to ask for it. Michael walked around the apartment, looking at everything, went into his room and was very surprised at how many new toys there were. In the corner there was a small, three-wheeled bicycle, which Charles had bought. My son got on it right away, but couldn't ride it. Sarah put his feet on the pedals and showed him how to pedal. With a little help, the baby raced around the apartment on the first vehicle of his life. He laughed so hard, and Sarah cried with happiness that her son was finally with her. She barely talked him into taking a lunch break. Then they watched cartoons with him, she explained everything to him and he nodded his head. In the evening he would splash around in the bathtub, he liked that, too. Maybe that's when he remembered the pool he loved to swim in. He slept soundly all night. When she went out for a walk in the yard on the playground, the neighbors looked at her in surprise. She had lived here long enough and had no child. Where did she get a baby, I wonder? She never had one in her life. Didn't she steal it from some mangy mama? Oh, come on. If she did, she wouldn't be out in the open. You know, I'll call the police and have them check it out. Vigilance and caution are never a bad thing. The next day, early in the morning, her doorbell rang, Hello, I'm a policeman. To what do I owe the pleasure, Sarah somehow tensed, and the precinct officer noticed it. And why are you so agitated? At this point Michael came out and stood looking at the uniformed uncle. Where did you get the baby from? You didn't have anyone until recently, did you, how did this rather grown-up boy show up? He's my son. May I see the child's papers? Sarah showed her birth certificate, there were pictures of her and Michael when he was very young. The policeman looked at them, made sure everything was in order, but before he left he still asked, where had the baby been all this time? At the orphanage. He was kidnapped from me almost a year and a half ago, and I found him at the orphanage. I brought him back yesterday. Here are the documents from the orphanage. Now he was reassured that the baby was really hers. After seeing all the narrow specialists in the hospital and making sure that her son had no problems with his hearing, she was referred to a neurologist. Having examined the child and listened to the mother, the doctor advised to send her son to the special kindergarten in a special group where he would be engaged and communication with children would also help him speak sooner. The kindergarten was private. There were five people in the group, a speech therapist worked with them, and there was a pediatrician. Sarah was relaxed, Michael was supervised. The cost per month for that kindergarten was steep, but that didn't scare her. She would do anything to keep her son healthy and happy. Michael loved kindergarten. Gradually he began to respond to his new name. He got comfortable at home, rode his bike, liked to look at books, but pointing at a picture with his finger, just mood. Sarah herself calmed down and said, You have to be patient. It's not the child's fault. He wants to talk, but something inside is holding him back. The lock won't open. So you haven't found the key yet. But it is there, we have to look for it, and not give up. Six months passed. Michael was cheerful, and the caregivers and doctors spoke well of him. She saw progress, too. He was much calmer, slept well, and started saying short words, he, give, one. Sarah was in seventh heaven, she was so excited, as if he were reading Shakespeare's sonnet in the original. But to her it was the same thing. 
Charles came over, invited them often for walks, took them out on nature trips. Michael was very drawn to him and one day on his birthday he called him daddy. This time Sarah cried, not with joy, but with resentment. No, well look at you, he called you daddy, and me, what am I to him? Sarah, don't yell, don't scare the baby again, he's just starting to calm down and you're throwing tantrums. If you're seriously that upset, I can leave and I won't bother you again. And he went to get dressed. Michael followed him, picked up his arms, and Charles took him in his arms. The baby put his palms on his cheeks and said again, Daddy. Charles kissed the baby and left. Sarah realized that because of her jealousy, or rather foolishness, she was losing not only a devoted friend, but the man she loved. She rushed after him, but the car had already pulled away from the house. What have I done? I have hurt a good man. He is the one who helped me with Michael. If it had not been for him, I would never have seen my son. How ungrateful I am. The holiday was spoiled a little by Sarah's antics. My son was sorting through the gifts he had been given. After a while, Sarah called Charles back, but he didn't pick up. She called him several times, but he wouldn't talk to her. Then she called a cab and drove with Michael to Charles's house. When he opened the door for them, the baby immediately reached for him, and Sarah stood with her eyes downcast, like a bad student. Forgive me, Charles, you fool. Well, that's how jealous I am. You factor that in, by the way. Why should I consider it? What do you mean why? I agree to marry you. Well, that's another thing. You don't resent me? Just a little bit. I can't forgive everything at once. You've got to walk around offended for a while. A long time? No. I'm not offended anymore. But please, never raise your voice, especially in front of your son. He needs to live in a calm environment. Yes, I understand, and I agree with you. Sarah didn't want an ordinary wedding. Let's register the marriage and go away for a week? Where shall we go? I'd like to go to the sea, but let's go there later. Let's go somewhere with children's activities. Let's show Michael the wonders, maybe the abundance of impressions will make him talk right away. After reviewing a huge number of suggestions, they settled on Copenhagen. Anderson lived there, which means everything around can be seen as a fairy tale. Every park in the Danish capital has fairy tale playgrounds. That's where they went, and they didn't miss it. His son was delighted by the wonders that awaited him in every corner of the children's parks. On this trip, he said the word Sarah had waited so long for, Mom. He truly loved them both. He loved sincerely, with all of his tiny, childlike heart. In spite of his age, he already knew what lies and betrayal are, for fear of hurting one of his parents. He hugged them one by one. The young family was happy. When they returned from their trip, they were in for a surprise that removed the rose-colored glasses that gave them a sense of eternal happiness. When the doorbell rang, Sarah happily told Michael, here comes daddy's milk already. And the child repeated, daddy. When she opened the door, she saw really a daddy she wouldn't want to see for another hundred years. What do you want? I need to talk to you. What can I talk to you about? Take your time, Sarah. I've come to talk about my son. A son? You told me to have an abortion imagine I had one and you don't have a child or you put him in an orphanage and he was adopted there. What kind of paternal feelings are we talking about? Go away, I can't see you. She tried to close the door, but he wouldn't let her. I understand that I am to blame, but I am not abandoning my direct duties, and you have no right to forbid me to communicate with my son. I have no children, and I won't have any more. He is the only heir I have. Grandmother wants to see her grandson, too. Let's agree on what day, I can come and communicate with the child. Not on any day. I'm against your communicating with the child. And even more so with someone like your mother. At this time Charles came up to the apartment. Seeing the excited Sarah, he became worried and immediately blocked her from Nicholas. What's wrong, Nicholas? 
Why are you here? Sarah will tell you all about it, and I'm leaving now. Bye. And he walked away. Not to frighten the child, Sarah calmed down and explained the purpose of Nicholas' arrival. You see, he now wanted to communicate with his son, his paternal feelings, kicked in. I remember very well how he told me that he didn't want to have children with a cleaning woman. That a scavenger could give birth to her own kind. And now he's changed his mind abruptly. I don't want him around my son. I don't want that disgusting woman, his wife, around my child. She humiliated me, and now she wants to communicate with the grandson I gave birth to, for a minute. Well, what are you not saying, Charles? What should we do? We should consult, but as far as I know, if he hasn't given up his parental rights, whether I adopt him or not, he still has the right to communicate with the child and perform all the duties of a father, but coming. And if I'm against it? Sarah, it's the law. And there's nothing you can do. I want to leave the country. I can't see him. He's a very mean man. Aren't they doing well with the business already, that he got a chance to think about his son? They managed to sell the house in Cyprus and buy the mansion here. Amelia's having trouble with her salons, of the five she had, there are two left. These still work. And Nicholas still has inspections going on, but he's complying with all the regulations, and slowly getting his tail out, which has bogged down a lot. But things aren't going as well as they'd like. May they die. How I hate them. What evil people, after all. I want to sue them so I never have to see them again. Freaks. They ruined my child's health, and that's all I'm going to say in court. I want to consult a lawyer. All right, he'll come to you. The lawyer listened carefully to Sarah. He already knew a lot from Charles, so the answer to the young mother was, in principle, ready. A sad story, he said, after hearing Sarah through, but I must disappoint you, dear. You don't have a single proof, not a single witness. But he raped me. And he'll say it was consensual. Or more than that, he will say that it was you, seeing the rich house, the rich master, who took advantage of the fact that Amelia could not have children and became pregnant, wanting to marry Nicholas. There will also be a further question from the prosecutor that you had intercourse on more than one occasion and remained silent, all the time. But he intimidated me, saying he would report the theft and I would go to jail. That's the only reason I kept quiet. Sarah, this is a trial. You will need evidence, witnesses right away. You don't have any. I believe you, but it's not enough. More than that? they can accuse you of wanting to make, as they say now, money. You were a poor student at the time, taking any job you could get. You made a big mistake by not reporting the rape and kidnapping. Do you think they would have helped in any way? That's the second question. But there would have been your statements there that could have been relied upon now. But you could at least start the case now. Especially since my son has a dash in the father's box on his certificate. Until a year he was not interested in it at all and did not pay me a penny. I perfectly remember the license plate E122, only I don't remember the order of the letters. It was in this car that my son was taken away, and it was Nicholas who snatched it out of my hands. Okay, the car can be found. But how can you prove that it was Nicholas who snatched the child from you? Well, my friend who I saw off after her birthday party can confirm that. Sarah wasn't telling the truth. Ginger had already left, and only then did Nicholas catch up with her and snatch the baby out of her hands. But she was willing to sell her soul to the devil, just not to let that freak take part in the baby's life. Is this true? You haven't spoken of such a witness before. Surely she'll confirm it? I can call her now, and you can talk to her yourself. Well, go ahead. That's great. Ginger, it's me. Do you remember Michael being kidnapped from me a few years ago? Can you confirm it in court that you saw Nicholas snatch the baby from me? Sarah, I wasn't there. I only know it on your word. Well, that's a good thing you can. My lawyer will talk to you now, tell me everything you know. And she handed the tube to the lawyer. 
Virginia, good afternoon. Did you really see this crime committed by Nicholas? Ginger froze. What should she do? To lie, as Sarah had asked her to do, would be breaking the law. And if she kept silent, the scoundrel wouldn't get what he deserved. How much grief he had caused her friend. And stepping on the throat of her own song, she answered, Yes, I saw this, and she hesitated, not knowing what to call this man, snatched the baby out of Sarah's arms, and how Michael cried. He was very frightened. If you're telling the truth, that's very good. Why do you doubt it? Because Sarah, having such a witness, didn't report the kidnapping. She was scared for some reason. That confuses me. He was intimidating her all the time, who she was a penniless student. And he's a respected and wealthy businessman. Thank you, Virginia. When I have to come to court, I'll tell you. Here Ginger got bolder and said, I'd love to come, even if he gets probation, he almost ruined the baby. When the lawyer left, Sarah called Ginger and arranged to meet her outside her magazine office. Charles knew that both Sarah and Ginger were not telling the truth. He was very worried about his wife. After all, there's such pros in court, they'll expose them at once with their tricky questions. The girls have to get ready, Charles thought. The day of the trial came. In the corridor, all the participants had gathered. Sarah saw lawyer Nicholas, after they had talked about something, Nicholas headed toward her and, in his usual form, began to intimidate her. So you've decided not to let me see my child? You can't do that. I have the right to do it, the law is on my side. And you, when you go out for a walk with your child, keep your head up and look under your feet, just in case. He paused meaningfully and stepped away from Sarah. At that moment everyone was invited into the courtroom. Sarah was shaking, and she kept drinking water to calm down. When it was time to question the witnesses, Ginger was called. Tell us, witness, what did you see and who did you see the day the child went missing? She told as they rehearsed with Sarah. Many questions were asked by the other side's lawyer, but Ginger didn't go down anywhere. It was Sarah's turn, he ripped the baby from me when we went out to see a friend off after her son's birthday party. I ran after the car, hoping to catch up, but it was raining that day and the wet asphalt left me no chance of catching up. I fell down, bleeding knees and palms, and the car drove off at that point. And when did you have time to remember the license plate, you were under so much stress, according to you, the rain was pouring in your face, so it also prevented you from seeing, and you ran after the car, fell and saw the license plate. Asked attorney Nicholas in a sneering tone. What are we doing now, sorting out my vision or kidnapping a child? Witness, keep your cool, the judge said sternly, and answered the lawyer's questions clearly. Yes, that's how I remembered it. But the fact that I remembered the number, I didn't remember right away. Because all I could see was my son and Nicholas running away. Why didn't you come right away and report the kidnapping? He always intimidated me, and when he raped me, he said that if I told the police, he would accuse me of stealing money and put me in jail, he intimidated me when he gave me money for an abortion, he said he did not want children from a cleaning lady, he even came up to me today, before the court hearing, and started intimidating me again. Don't believe her, shouted Nicholas, I didn't say anything like that to her, much less intimidate her. And Sarah turned on her phone, from which Nicholas' voice poured out. Here you are. This is the recording I made half an hour ago. I'm afraid of that man and I can't trust him with a child, especially after his wife, with his acquiescence, has put Michael in an orphanage. Only because the child began to stutter. And why did he stutter? Isn't it because this deadbeat daddy frightened him and it didn't go unnoticed by the child? I ask the esteemed court to leave the request for communication with the child without satisfaction. This is a scary man. Then both attorneys spoke, and Nicholas invited someone from work. They talked about what a good boss he was, but Sarah wasn't listening very well, she was waiting for the verdict of the court. The court dismissed Nicholas' request. When everyone left the courtroom, Sarah couldn't get up and Ginger, supporting her, led her to the car. She was so tired that she felt no joy. But she knew it would look very different tomorrow.
She really hoped never to see this man again in her life or in Michael's life. Three years had passed since the events described above. Michael was growing up to be a wonderful boy. Even though he was already reading and writing in print, his parents decided to send him to school at age seven. Still, sometimes when he began to worry, he stuttered a little. Doctors thought this was the right decision of his parents. The body would get stronger by the age of seven and everything would be fine. The only other thing that saddened Sarah and Charles was the lack of children together. Both were perfectly healthy and though. It happens, the doctors told them, be patient and work at it. There's nothing stopping you from having many children. Perhaps your wife's stress from her first pregnancy is preventing you from conceiving. The main thing is not to get discouraged. And they didn't despair, they just lived, loved each other and Michael. Sarah became editor of the photo magazine and got Ginger involved. She herself not only handled the selection of illustrations and photographs, was responsible for the artwork for the article or cover, but was also very active in taking photographs. The most famous artists worked in their magazine. They considered it an honor to be printed in such a cool publication. The photo exhibition and children are our everything, or love your children, was a great success. Instead of three days, the exhibit ran for a week. Michael also visited his mom's exhibit. He asked a lot of questions, which his parents answered. But here was the last question none of them could answer. Why don't I have a little brother or sister? Asked Michael, looking at a photo of the babies cuddling. We're thinking about that question, dad replied. Think soon, because I'm bored alone, I don't even have anyone to cuddle with. That same evening, as Michael fell asleep, Sarah sat down by her husband's side and said, Why don't we take the baby out of the orphanage? Even if it's just one, we can make him happy. When my son was in the orphanage, he was friends with a girl named Ruby. He didn't even want to leave without her. But at that point, I couldn't think of anyone but my son, so I grabbed him in my arms and put him in your car. And now you and I could go back there. What do you think about that, do you mind? Well, why, the house is big, you and I make enough money. We can raise the kids. What if she's already adopted? We'll see, we'll take Michael with us. The next weekend they all went together to the orphanage where Michael had been taken from three years earlier. The director wasn't in her office, so they went for a walk in the yard. About 20 minutes passed, and they headed into the building. The door opened in front of them. And who did they see? Nicholas and Amelia. Nicholas was holding a boy about three or four years old, whom he called Nick. Desperate to get Michael, they decided to take the child from the orphanage. They thought and argued for a long time and finally came to a consensus. They had done a lot of things, it was hard to forgive them to a mere man, but God, he is so merciful. Seeing her former employers, Sarah became so nervous that she asked Charles to put her on the bench. She pulled Michael to her. Charles realized she was afraid for the baby and took her son in her arms. Don't worry, they're already gone, can you get up and go? I don't feel well. She sat for a while longer in the air, then quietly went to the supervisor's office. The supervisor greeted them admirably. Michael, how grown up and handsome you've become. How are you doing? Thanks, I'm fine. Are you going to school this year? No, next year. I'm very happy for you and the baby. Excuse me, has Ruby been taken into the family yet? Can we see her? Do you want to take her? The supervisor asked, looking at Sarah. Sarah blinked. Something she didn't have the energy to say. As she entered the group, the supervisor said hello as usual, and all the kids turned to those who had entered the group. And then Ruby, Sarah didn't even recognize her, came up to Michael and they hugged. The headmistress stood crying and Sarah sat down in her chair. Her husband gave her a drink of water so she could react more calmly to everything. The children played some more and Michael took Charles away. We'll get the paperwork together and come get the baby. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you and see you later. As they drove home, Michael kept saying something. Mom, I remember her. 
She loved to comb my hair, and I loved it, he kept saying and reminiscing about his time at the orphanage. During the night Sarah became quite ill, her temperature rose and her husband called an ambulance. We'll take her to the hospital, examine her, and only then will we say what's wrong with her. They gave her an injection and she slept through the night. In the morning she gave as much blood as she had ever given in her entire life. By lunchtime, her husband and son arrived. Charles left his son with Sarah and went to the doctor himself. What's wrong with my wife? Why does she have such a high fever? It's not like she has a cold. Does she have something serious? You tell it like it is. I have the possibility of taking her abroad if some serious treatment is needed. There's no need for any overseas. This disease is well treated in our country. Especially since it's not a disease, it's a pregnancy. What, he jumped up in his chair. Young man, you startled me. Sit down and calm down. Your wife is eight weeks pregnant. It's not long, so we can't tell what you're having yet, but the pregnancy is going well. There's no danger to the fetus. Just be careful, don't overburden her, and just love her and be attentive to her. That's probably all you can recommend. You can take her home, and the doctor gave him the discharge form. When he entered the room, Sarah looked at him and waited for something scary. What's wrong with me? Something serious? Of course it's serious, when weren't babies a serious matter? What babies, what are you talking about? Honey, we're pregnant. We? Well, of course. I've waited so long for this, I'll be walking along with you pregnant too, taking care of you for the whole nine months. Charles, I can't believe it. I couldn't believe it myself, but the doctor meant it. The attending physician came into the room. Have you been happy with your spouse yet? Yes, doctor, we are happy. Take care. You can go home. All the next week they spent gathering the paperwork for Ruby's adoption. A month passed. The paperwork was ready, and Charles went to pick up the baby with Michael. Sarah was not taken so as not to shake her for two hours in the car. All evening Michael was out of sight, out of hearing. They were together with Ruby in the playroom. Only laughter could be heard, and the parents peeked through the slightly ajar door. Seven months later a boy Alex came into the family. He, too, was born in April, like his older brother. There was triple joy in the family, because there were three children. The older children were looking forward to the arrival of their little brother and were very happy about his birth. As Sarah fed little Alex, the older children watched with what appetite he was eating. Anne Charles, catching an interesting moment of moms with three kids, took a beautiful photo and put it on the cover of the new issue of the photo magazine. It was sold out in a matter of hours. When the baby was eight months old, Sarah was invited to participate in a European exhibition organized by Life magazine. The motto of the exhibition were the beautiful words, there is life, there is hope. She took her photos and invited Ginger, she was a genius at her craft. The friends took all the children and flew to Europe. The exhibition was a resounding success. The best photographers participated. There was a lot to learn. Crawling into a far corner and feeding her son, she thought about how long and difficult her road to success had been. How tragic her path to happiness had been. She still had many plans and with a husband like hers, there was no doubt that they would all come true. She loved the motto of the show, now it will be her motto, there is life, there is hope. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.